Matthew 28, 19 says to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. So as mothers, one of the great responsibilities that we have is to raise our children to love Jesus and love the nations that he died for. So let's have a conversation about being godly moms who raise Jesus-loving kids. Welcome. AIMS.org is a ministry whose mission is to take the message of Jesus to people who have no access. And on this podcast, we have God-centered conversations about everything from how to live for Jesus to business, relationships, the struggles of life. You can download a discussion guide for this episode at aims.org slash podcast. And now let's begin. You are in for a treat today. We want to do a podcast for mothers just giving all of our best tips, any advice we have, any of our failures, anything that we can offer to moms is what we want to do in this interview. And I couldn't pick two people that I just respect and honor more. So you're going to meet one of my very best friends, Lori Roach, and she is a mom to five kids. So she's got a 20 year old, a 19 year old, 17 year old, a 16 year old, and a 14 year old. She did the whole back to back to back to back. (laughs) baby thing. And she's an amazing mom. And I've learned so much from her. And then I am going to introduce you to Sonia Otero. And Sonia is very special to me because the Bible talks about a Titus two woman. And it says that the older women should mentor the younger women specifically in marriages and in child raising and with their children. And she is that like she mentored Lori and I, she said that we were some of the first women that she discipled. But since then, I mean, it's been more than 20 years. She's just mentored and mentored and mentored and mentored. And she's raised three. They're adults now, and they all love God, have a heart for nations, have a heart for people. And so first thing is I want to talk about a godly mother. So we're talking to moms. And what are some godly, what are some of the characteristics of a godly mother? And we can talk through some points of what are the characteristics and then just you share your stories and insight. But Sonia, what are some characteristics? What's one characteristic, two, three? What are some characteristics of a godly mother? The first thing that comes to my mind is consistency. I know that may sound out there, but just consistency in your devotion, consistency in your confession consistency and how you get up after you've fallen down, um, as we all do at times, um, just consistency to uh, do what you're going to say or do what you say you're going to do. Don't don't let it be an idle threat um, or don't even let it be something that you say flippantly. You carry out the actions that you've spoken of. Okay. So I have something to say about that. When Haven was like two years old, she was getting out of bed every single night. So like she wasn't, we were not sleeping at all. She was, she would come to our room every night in the middle of the night. And I remember telling you about this and like, how's life? And I'm like, I'm just so tired. Haven won't sleep. She comes and gets in our bed every night. And you were like, well, have you asked her not to do that? And I was like, well, yeah, but she doesn't care. She, she's too, she comes in our room every night. And you're like, so she's disobeying. And I didn't even, I'm like, well, as a matter of fact, I guess she is disobeying. And you're like, well, if you've asked her to do something and she's not doing it, then she's disobeying. And so you need to teach her that and discipline in that way. And I was like dumbfounded because I didn't even think of that, of the fact that, okay, if I'm telling her to do something and she's not doing it, she's disobeying. And if I'm not disciplining that, then I'm training her that it's okay to just not do what I say. That very night, I was like, okay, Haven, if you do that tonight, that means you're disobeying. And what happens if you disobey? And she's like, I get disciplined. I get a spanking. And I was like, yes, and that's going to happen if you do that tonight. Well, I mean, she did it that (laughs) that night. She came and I was like, Haven, I told you I was going to have to discipline you if you did this. And she's like, I know you can spank me, (laughs) but she still wanted, (laughs) but I recently heard, um, it was a sad story because I'd heard a professional telling mothers that when your child's throwing a tantrum, you pick them up and you look the other way and you hold them and restrain them so they don't hurt themselves, but you look the other way. And um, I do think that challenges do definitely arise in areas where we've made mistakes. And that's one of the areas that I see in mistakes of mamas where we don't consistently discipline our children. And you know, the word of God says to spare the rod or spoil the child. 
and love your child enough to discipline. And so I do think that's significant in helping to mold them into who God desires them to be, because it's it's so adequate. Or I mean, it's so momentous that they listen to your voice, re- recognize that you're just establishing boundaries for their protection, their safety, their provision. And outside of that boundary, you can't protect them. And the same thing applies with God. So, of course, if we don't learn to recognize his voice and obey his requirements or his commandments, then we're out from under his protection, guidance, provision, all of those things. So a godly mother makes disciples of her kids. And in order to make disciples, there has to be an element of discipline. Lori, do you have anything to weigh in on that? Absolutely. Uh, One of the statements we used to say a lot in our house is about obedience is first time, every time with a happy heart. Oh, you always want to reward the behaviors you want to see. And so anytime that my kid is doing something that I've asked them to do, or even if I didn't ask them to do it, but I've asked them to do it in the past, I'm instantly going to say, look at you, look at you obeying mommy for the first time and look at your happy heart. That makes my heart so happy when I see your heart, you know, being happy about obeying and just making it a pleasant experience for them to obey because it, it brings so much goodness and promise to their lives. And, you know, piggybacking off what, what Sonia said, we, if we don't make that um, like a master pillar in our home, um, then how are they going to obey the voice of the Lord? Because we know that sometimes the Lord asks us to do things that is, that are, that is really difficult. And so by, by making sure um, that our children are listening and they're obeying and they're doing with a happy heart, I feel like we're helping to to gird up those moments when it's not going to be as easy to well, obey. Them. Yeah, that's smart that you talk about celebrating, like when they are doing it, making sure that we're recognizing you did obey. That's what it looks like to obey quickly. Obedience is quick. It's not drawn out. Delayed obedience is disobedience is what I tell my kids. Kind of the same thing. A godly mother makes disciples of her kids. So Matthew 28, 19 says to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And at Ames, we're all about that, making disciples of the nations. And we realize that we make disciples of our children. Like that's that's our highest calling as mothers, that we're going to make disciples of these kids and we're going to teach them to have a heart for Jesus, to love the nations that Jesus died for. And we're making disciples, we're training them, we're disciplining them. So great, awesome. What about a godly mother realizes that she's partnering with God to raise her kids? Do you have any thoughts about that? One of the the scriptures that has kind of been a guiding scripture for me personally is John 16, 13, spirit of truth comes and guides us into all truth. And so before I had children, you know, I, I relied on that heavily. And then I went through a season where, you know, I feel like raising babies and toddlers, you, you don't really have to ask Holy Spirit to show you a lot of things, you know, that, that they're going to get into, right? Because you know, you're right there and you're watching them all. But man, has this scripture just been kind of like a rock solid foundational scripture that I can come back to over and over with teenagers. You know, my children, um, they haven't always made perfect decisions. And I think that in itself is something that we as moms, we need to just understand they're learning how to follow Jesus. And sometimes that means, you know, they're going to trip up. And so bigger kids make bigger mistakes. So one of the things I've fallen onto is, is I'm, is I, in my mind, I've, I've got this mindset of, I am raising these world changers. Okay. I'm not raising robots. I'm not raising children that don't, that are going to do everything perfectly the first time. I'm raising followers of Jesus that are going to love him and understand grace. And so Holy Spirit, I need you to show me in areas that like traps that the enemy wants to set for my child, you know, because in this society that we live in, um, there are so many ways the devil wants to take our kids out. and so. As moms who are full of the Holy Spirit, we have this amazing gift dwelling inside of us that will literally show us things that can get in our own kids' way. I love that you are explaining that. We're not raising perfect people. We're raising people that are learning (laughs) to follow God, just like we did. And we needed grace and we need grace in our lives consistently. And so we have to teach them that too. 
Sonia, what do you think about that? You're partnering with God to raise your kids. I'm partnering with God, but the only way I can do that is according to um, John 15, 5, where it says, where it's Jesus speaking. And he says, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And if we don't take time to connect ourselves on a daily basis, that's when we allow ourselves to be misguided, uh, whether it's through by our culture, or whether it's the events of the world or all those things. And so in order to guide the children, in order to partner up with God to support that relationship, I have to be able to speak the same words that God would to their hearts. And not only by my words, but by my actions. So you're talking about spending time with God consistently. I think that's as a mom. Yeah. And when I always tell my mom that there's something that really stuck with me about her. She, when I would go downstairs in the mornings, like, you know, getting my breakfast before school, I often saw her there with her Bible and I don't know what she was reading. I just knew that she was and that it did something in my heart. I just knew I want to you know, I want to seek the word too. And I think that she probably was doing that because I wasn't the easiest kid to raise. So she's probably like, Lord, (laughs) give me some guidance on this one. But, but I think it's really, you're right. We can't partner with God if we're not spending time with him, but then also we're partnering with God. It kind of takes some of the response, the pressure off, not the responsibility, but the pressure of, we have to do everything right. No, like he is, developing these people and we're partnering with him. He has plans for their life. And my job is to support what, what God, what do you want to do with Haven? I want to be a part of helping her fulfill your plan. What do you want to do with honors life? I'm just partnering with you, God. So you have a plan for his life. And my job is to not have my own plans for honors life, but to partner with you, God, in fulfilling that plan. And so I think that that's very important for moms to realize is we don't pick the plans. We don't get to plan it all out. We get the privilege of partnering with Jesus in raising these kids to do what he's destined them and created them to do. Or Bevan, one of the things that um, popped in my mind too, especially since um, the world is ever changing, as we know, the culture is ever changing and um, embracing all kinds of things that steal and distract our attentions. I mean, at a mo- if we have an idle moment, what are we doing? Checking my phone, check my text, check my email. And s- instead of back in the day where you had time to sit quietly and and actually think about the things of God, take more time to pray. Instead, now, too many times we get distracted by the loud noise going on in our community and our mama's meetings and our uh, expectations of our everyday life. And it's so important to make sure that you are taking the time because I've been guilty when I was a busy mama where I overlooked it. And I remember my mother-in-law saying one time to me when I was a a bit cranky, if you will, um, I remember her asking me specifically, have you been in the word lately? And I was convicted. I knew that, no, I had not been, which is why my response was being so negative. Well, do you have any solutions to that? Because that's a big deal. Even, I mean, that's a battle in my own life that I'm just like, stop being distracted by the phone and by the, the shows and all of this. So like, how do we not? Cause that's not something you, when you were a mom, that wasn't even a reality. And now right. I well, see it with your kids and your daughter. And, and I think of my life back when it was simpler, it was easy to embrace the day. There weren't expectations viewing in on my life. There weren't, um, somebody to compete with on that screen that I was trying to be like or pursue the things they were, what it, the things that we get caught up with when we see things. I've um, often thought my, in my day-to-day life now, because it's become so noisy in our, cult, in our communities or in our thoughts, it would be so simple to go back to the days where we're feeding the chickens and digging up the garden and your, th- your thoughts were simple and open to hear God's voice in the quietness of the day, not necessarily not doing anything. I'm not talking about that. They worked hard, but it was being open to hear rather than constantly filling my mind with something other than my family and the word of God. So we need to get chickens. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, I think- absolutely. Lord. I think on a very practical basis, um, you know, one of the, one of the rules, I guess you could say of our house is 
um, specifically at dinner, I mean, there's absolutely no phones at the table. Yes. And really, How? we have a- Do you have, have like a, a basket? Pretty, you make them drop oh, it in they the basket? Just leave it in their room. <laughs> but really, we have a pretty strict, you know, I guess you should say guideline around the phones anyway, um, that whether you choose, like when you come home from school, whether you choose to play video games or watch a movie or be on your phone, you've got about 30 minutes to do that. And that's about it because these phones have, have taken over our kids' lives. And so, and so again, it, it is one of those things like I can fight it and I can be irritated by it, or I can use it for my benefit and, and, and try to say, okay, this is why we don't do this. And so if I'm going to say that, then I have to lead by example. So piggybacking on what you said about your mom, I mean, it is one of those things that I want my children, not so that they can say, oh, look at my mom, she's doing Bible. I want to show them, I want to model to them what it looks like to be a Jesus follower. So as they were little, when I, I took the job of like making these disciples very seriously. So when they're little, it's like when we, look, when we go into the car, we're only listening to worship. It's not because I'm a legalistic person. I like all kinds of music. But as I'm raising these kids and, and forming these little hearts, you know, partnering alongside Holy Spirit, I'm like, kids, look at this. This is how you worship. Raise your hands in the car. You know, you're there in their car seat. When, when they see me reading their Bible, this is why you read your Bible. Get your Bible in here. Let's read it together. And so does it morph and change as they get older? Absolutely. Is it harder to gather everybody around the couch and read the Bible together and pray? Absolutely. But man, as often as I can gather my, my kiddos together and whether we just read one chapter or we discuss it, or we're praying about their friends, those are the ways that we I've, I've really said, okay, Lord, I want it in order for me to make these disciples, I have to be intentional. I have to be intentional about everything that, um, that we get to do. And so as they get older, you know, that intention is it's, it's something that I, I like, I will move heaven and earth to make sure all my kids are around that table, right? Right, Sonia? Yeah. And so when we get those moments, we want to make the most of it. And so I think being an educator, being a teacher of high school students, I have seen parents be afraid of making a really hard boundary around phones and technology. And I think why? We're doing our kids a huge disservice if we allow them to have to let that thing be more influential than what we are. And, you know, can I put back on that, Lori, and say that in, in allowing smartphones um, to dictate to our children where they look to for affirmation, that's why it's upon us to make sure that we are setting those boundaries with the agreement of our husband and so that all are involved in the family, not just the mama saying, but in agreement with the supervisor of our home and the caregiver of our hearts and provider, um, we get to admire and recognize the fact that we do not need to look to the affirmations of people, but only of God. That's good advice. Another um, characteristic of a godly mother is that she teaches her children about their identity in Christ. So how do we do that? How do we teach them about their identity? Like I want for Haven and Honor to understand that they are children of the King, that they have full access. That's something I often try to teach them is you have access. You're like a prince and a princess. You have access to the King. You can go to the King. You can go to God. You can talk to him. There's nothing, there's no barrier. You, you have full and total access to go and talk to him because you're a child and you're an ambassador of the King. And I also really try to help them understand that they are ambassadors, that their entire purpose is to push back the darkness so that the glory of God can fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. So I'm reminding them like, hey, just remember you're a soldier. You're an ambassador. You represent Jesus today in your school. You represent God wherever you go. And I'm always putting that. And I even honor when he was little, he had the biggest cute lips like from as soon as he could talk, I'm like, okay, honor say, I'm strong. I'm I strong. I brave. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And Jesus loves me. And Jesus loved me. And I will serve him all the days of my long life. And so every single night he would say that. So like he's been saying that his entire life. As far as identity, I think I learned this probably from Lori, but I never, ever speak negative over them. Like if my kids were to say a lie, I would never say like, why are you lying? You lie. I would, and I would tell them, 
whoa, that's not who you are. You just did something that isn't even in line with your character. You're a person who loves the truth. So how was that? How does that feel that you just said something that wasn't truthful because you love the truth? And so I just always was telling them, you love the truth. You love the truth or loving each other. I remind them, you guys love each other. You're a brother and sister who you love each other because you love God and it's worship. The way that you love one another is an act of worship to God. And just always reminding them when you see the negative, not saying, why are you fighting with your brother so much? Or why are you acting like that to your sister? I, I try to remind them of who they are because it, it makes them stand taller and they realize, whoa, I'm acting some way that's not who I am. And so how do you teach your children identity? Sonia and then Lori. I don't know how to put it in words. I do recall someone, I don't recall who it was. I remember them saying, if you don't want your children to act like you, why not? Mm -hmm. Because if you're mimicking or trying to reflect the Lord Jesus himself, why wouldn't you want them to act like you? And so I think it's just really important that we um, reflect God's character in our times where we have to say, I'm sorry, I repent, I, I was wrong and yeah. quickly doing so. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, it's good for us as parents to actually show where we've been wrong. I'm sorry, I sinned against God or whatever the, the reference is to whatever sin it is, but truly be honest um, when you're in that position and let your kids see that reflection that you do demonstrate demonstrate repentance you are quick to forget that's huge Lori. what about you how can you teach your children about their identity one of the the words that we've all kind of grown up with is you know getting a rhema word from the lord whenever there's things that come up in our life circumstances and that has really stayed with me for so many years and when i had children the first thing we do is as believers when we understand our authority if there's something coming against us we find all the scriptures right to combat the darkness, like we talked about. But what is so awesome about Holy Spirit and, and rhema word, the spoken word of God over our kids, is we have access to all the treasures of heaven and, and the creator of heaven and earth has specifically given us this unique, beautiful child. And so because of that, I know that the Lord has something specific for this child. And so one of my privileges, my greatest privileges as a mom is seeking God and saying, Father, what do you say about my kid? And so for each of my kids, the Lord has given me like a name for them that kind of marks who they are. So I have a child that the Lord said, this child is a warrior. Now that scared me a little bit because I'm like, Father, I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter, you know? <laughs> How am I going to raise a warrior, you know? So then the Lord takes me and Holy Spirit will give me a specific scripture to pray over this child. And so when this child is displaying you know, behaviors that don't, you know, reflect who I know them to be, I can remind them this. I remind myself, Holy Spirit, this is what you told me about this person, this child. And then I'm able to speak it into their destiny. And I'm telling you, just like um, discipline does, I, I have seen such a, a quick change of countenance when I begin to call out the gold of my kids and remind them, this is who you are. God is so gracious to us. He's such a good father. He loves us so much that he really wants to be very specific with us. And so I, I just say, seek and ask the Lord and he will give you specific scriptures that you can use. And man, we know that that is the way against the enemy and, and to push back the darknesses is the word of God. And so how powerful is it when God gives us a specific scripture for our individual child. And it is true. I've seen it with my kids. The countenance, it changes so quickly, far greater than any parent who's saying, why are you doing this? Trying to get results with our own man-made you know, ways. I think the most effective way is to speak identity that you truly believe because you've spent time with the father, hearing what he says about your kid, like you're saying, reminding yourself, okay, they're not a tyrant and a terror. They're actually a warrior <laughs> who's going to do great things for the kingdom. And then reminding that child, you are a warrior and you may be, the darkness may be closing in around you right now. And you may be succumbing to some of that, but that is not who you are. You're a warrior. You're going to be victorious. God has big things for your life. And just reminding them about identity is huge. 
Bevan, can I contribute this? Yes. I know that so many times as you spoke about the words that we speak over our children, um, as well as we have certain expectations that were taught by people before us. Um, one of the things that I wanted to refer to was you've heard the saying terrible twos. Yes. And I reject that. <laughs> One of the things that we were instructed, shared with when we had younger children was they, they said growing kids God's way. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, Yeah, but it's, a, it's a way of raising your children according to God's word. But they said, when you're saying terrible twos, you're claiming it basically. Yeah. And don't recognize the terrible, recognize the good find the good. As in Lori was saying earlier, she was saying, recognize the positives, focus in on that, hone in on that. And you'll see a result. Um, we refuse to say terrible twos. We refuse as well as in our teens. Oh my gosh, those teens. No, don't, don't buy into that either because there are going to be challenges that you face. Yes. But as a parent, you get to guide those, their focus, you get to guide and set before them the options that they have at that point in their life. And so that can contribute to life rather than the opposite. So um, watch your confessions over your children and your chief teenagers. Don't say when someone says you have teenagers, oh my gosh, I'm going to pray for you. I mean, it's, it's not that way. God gave them to you. Yes, it's challenging, but you are armed with the word of God to speak into their life and prayer Prayer, prayer, prayer. I didn't access prayer with my kids like I know to do now, but pray for your children diligently because that's where the strength is. Mm -hmm. A godly mother prays for her children. Yeah, Colossians 4 2, it says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And so we rely on the Holy Spirit to show us how to pray. Like, how do I pray for my eight year old boy? God, what does he need right now? Is it confidence? Is it, you know, God will show you what to pray or how do I pray for my 28 year old child and what they're dealing with? I think that is the privilege that we do have as moms, that we know them so well that God will show us so specifically how to pray. And it's a privilege that we need to definitely do, that we pray for our kids. All right. So I want to ask, what are some of the challenges of motherhood? I think some of the challenges of motherhood are, you know, doubting the fact that we have the capabilities to raise these children. And so, so many times I find myself ministering to myself and to my friends saying, I am anointed to be these, these children's mom. The greater one lives inside of me. And even when I feel my weakest, that's when Holy Spirit makes me strong. And I wrote the scripture in second Corinthians in the, in the passion that says, my grace is always more than enough for you. My power finds its expression through your weakness. So sometimes at the end of a day, when I felt like I didn't do everything perfect and I probably was yelling and, and hollering, um, I can, at the end of the day, get with my little people and say, mommy is sorry. She did not do a great job today. And, but Jesus is helping me even every time I feel weak and as that has progressed into teenage years, there's been times when I've, I have let condemnation come in on myself and think you did such a good job as a mom of toddlers and, and small children. And now you're, you're blowing it as a mom of teenagers. And, you know, sometimes the enemy just, you know, he wants to plant lies with our kids, but he also wants to plant them in our, in our minds. And so one of the best practical pieces of advice I've received as parenting moms of teens is uh, my friend told me, she said, you, you make decisions from two places, either love or fear. And so when we're raising these teenagers, there's so many reasons and, and opportunities for us to get into fear. There just is. They have phones. They, you know, they have, they have access to anything right now. And just like less than 30 seconds. So when, when they're asking me to do something, okay, they, they want to, they're asking me, can I go out with this person? Can I do this? I immediately have an opportunity. Am I going to get into fear and raise them out of that fear place and say, oh no, you can't do that because this and this and this, or am I raising them from love, which loves gives love gives boundaries, right? But that piece of practical advice has so helped me kind of navigate through my, my years as a teenage mom, am I making, because it's going to be challenging. 
Am I making these decisions? Am I, am I making these boundaries based out of a fearful place or a loved place? And perfect love casts out fear, the Bible says. So, well, guys, before we get off, is there anything else you want to give the people? Any, you got any great tips, tricks, anything that you want to just share before we close this up? I'll add this. Okay. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend upon your own understanding. I, I think it's so important that we not compare ourselves with other mothers, that we not put ourselves in a position where we're looking out for affirmations, um, but to apply the word of God into your children by example, love, service, um, connection to people, and, um, and speak truth. I mean, I, I remember my mom saying before, when I was little, I don't care what your question is, Come to me with it. If I don't know the answer, I will find the answer and give it to you. Um, now, you may have to provide it in a, a four-year-old answer, but speak truth to your children and they'll relate to you. They won't be afraid to come to you. So the challenges are there and there are many, but God will give you understanding with what to do and how to behave. And um, anyway, so be Amen. blessed. Amen. Boy. Well, that was a great conversation with two women who are so intentional about their mothering. And so there's so much we can learn. We've created a discussion guide with you with some practical applications so that you can kind of make this conversation personal and apply it to your own life. So I invite you to go to aims.org slash podcast, and there you'll be able to download a discussion guide for this episode or any of our previous episodes. The first practical application from this conversation, we talked about phones a lot in the beginning of the conversation. And so what I'd like you to do is to write down a plan. What is God showing you about phones or screens or media or television in your own home? Make a plan. Ask God how he wants you to create boundaries around phones and media in your own home and write down your plan. Write it down so that you can see what God's saying and then implement it. The second practical application, we talked a lot about identity and speaking words of life over your kids. And so I want you to write down the names of your kids and then write down some words of life that you can speak over them, that you will speak over them this week. The third thing, Lori talked about making decisions based out of fear or out of love. And so I want you to take a few minutes and ask the Lord, are there things that I've been doing? Are there ways that I've been mothering that are from a place of fear? And ask God to show you those things and write them down and then ask him, how can you turn that from making a decision based out of fear into based out of love? So thank you for listening to the podcast. We ask you to like, subscribe, share this podcast. And I just want to encourage you that you are anointed. If you're a mother and God has given you children, those are your children for a reason. He's anointed you to raise them. He's given you everything that you need. He's given you the Holy Spirit so that you can know how to raise them. And just don't ever doubt that. Lean in to the Holy Spirit and love those children as worship to the Lord. Happy Mother's Day. Well, you know, I got jokes. <laughs> you think my husband has the jokes? I got jokes. Um, these are Mother's Day jokes and they are very ridiculous, but okay. Why did the mommy cat want to go bowling on Mother's Day? She was an alley cat. How did the panda open her Mother's Day card? With her bare hands. And lastly, what did the mommy spider say to the baby spider? You spend too much time on the web. You're welcome. <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening. Will you do something for us? Share this episode on social media, hit the subscribe or follow button and leave a good review. You can also give to this ministry to help get the gospel to unreached nations by going to aims.org. One last thing, don't just listen, but apply what you heard by filling out the discussion guide and inviting others to do the same. Thank you so much for making a difference in the nations.